if you have your Bibles, or if not, there's one in the pew for you. Uh, turn to Hebrews with me, the ninth chapter of Hebrews. Now, we've done a study recently out of chapters of Hebrews 8, 9, and 10, which is full of New Covenant theology. And it's a, it shows you the transition from the Old Covenant to New Covenant in the theology. It's just a magnificent passage. So I returned today on uh, grace cleansing. Uh, I'm going to pick it up at verse 12. I hate doing that, but I don't want to read the whole chapter. And I want to pick up the subject of the theology of the blood of Christ. In verse 12, he shows you how in the Old Testament it was shadow Christology. There was theology of the blood in the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. But in the Old Testament, it was the blood of calves and goats, and, and that was shadow Christology, looking to the day when the Messiah would come and actually fulfill that teaching. Uh, Jesus in Matthew 5, when he's talking on the great Sermon on the Mount, uh, discussed the fact that the, when the Messiah would come, he would fulfill the law. And, and that's exactly what he did when he went to the cross. He fulfilled all of that historical uh, theology called shadow Christology in Hebrews 10. One is called shadow Christology. He fulfilled all that when he went to the cross. All that sacrificial stuff that went with it, like Jan Kemper, the Day of Atonement, all of that whole system of animal sacrifice and all of that was to reflect the day when Christ would come and fulfill that. The way he did it was by going to the cross. The way he did that. So the the writer of Hebrews is now picking that idea up, and I jumped in the middle of the conversation, not through the, verse 12, and not through the blood of goats and calves, that's, that's old covenant theology attached to Yom Kippur atonement, uh, as well as other ones, but that's the big one. Um, but through his own blood, see the difference? Look at the word through. And there's two different theologies. Now, they're not different today in that Christ came. But in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood. So what Christ did is he come, when he died on the cross, it was the theology of the blood. Now, here's what's interesting. I'm going to pause a minute because here's what's of interest. A person doesn't have to know the theology of the blood to be saved. Let me show you how simple this is. But they do have to believe that Christ died on the cross. Let me show you how simple this is. For an unbeliever to get saved, all he has to believe that Jesus died for his sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day. In 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, Paul calls that the gospel, the good news. All he has to do is believe that Christ died for his sins. And he certainly came to do that. He doesn't have to know the theology of it. In fact, he couldn't know it because he doesn't have the spirit in him to understand divine revelation. So he couldn't anyhow. But he doesn't have to. But we as Christians do. Because what God wants to do is to teach his children born again through the gospel of Christ, the theology behind his son dying on a cross. Listen, we, when we study the theology of the cross of Jesus Christ, we get to see God's view for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would not perish, John, John 3, 16, but have everlasting life. You don't have to know that theology to be saved the theology that I'm teaching you about the blood of Christ. But after you're saved, you should have a desire to know it because you get a chance to see the heart of God and what God was trying to accomplish when he sent his son to die on the cross, quote, the cross of the blood of Christ. Uh, Colossians 1.20 talks about the blood of the cross. And for a Christian, he ought to know that because God wants him to know what the theology is of his son dying on a cross. It's the theology of the blood of Christ. 
Now, let me show you. We take part, all Christian churches, if they have a wit of sense, take part in the Eucharist. Agreed? Everybody. I mean, with the, without the theology of the Eucharist, the church is pretty handicapped. I mean, the Eucharist is a big deal. Now, listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty five. 25. Listen to what he says. Just listen. Just listen. Because you're going to know this when you hear it. So just listen to what he says. Because sometimes we miss what he says. He says, he says at, 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 Paul is referring to the last supper of the Lord with his disciples. And he said, he raised the cup and he said, the, the cup of the old covenant of the blood. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. Now, when they poured that cup at the last supper, it was the cup of the old covenant. When he lifted it up, he said, there's a big change coming, boys. This cup is the, new, is, the new, is the cup of the new covenant, watch this now, in my blood. Not the blood of calves, goats, because that, that in the Old Testament, it symbolized shadow Christology, the blood of calves and goats and all that, which could never take away sin. It wasn't intended. It was to point to Christ who would come and take away. And when he came, he would take care of all sin, past, present, and future. Now, when we sit down at the Eucharist, God expects us to know the theology behind the blood of the cup. Because the blood of the cup is everything of theology. God wants us to understand what was behind the theology of him sending his son to die on a cross, i.e., his blood. So he says, Jesus says to his disciples, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, do the, as often you do this, as often as you do this, do this in what? Remembrance of me. What is the remembrance? It's what the cup represents. What does a cup represent? It represents what? What did he say his cup represented? His blood. The blood of the new covenant. He said that cup represents my blood. What does that mean? When you raise that cup, you're supposed to have your mind connected to the contents of the cup, which is the blood of Christ that was shed for the sins of the world. So you've got to understand, to have the significance. It's not just the blood. It's what the blood represents. You need to know the theology of the blood. So here comes Paul. Paul comes along who introduces to us the idea of the Eucharist in 1 Corinthians 11.25 and teaches us the theology behind the blood of Christ. And so we've been doing a study on the nine, nine theology doctrines or factors of communion with God because the Eucharist is all about communion with God. And, who's he, and who is it for? Believers. It's for believers. And he says, I want you, and the whole idea of, of Eucharist is communion with God through the blood of his son. But what God wants you to know is the theology. And so Paul comes along and writes about the theology of the blood because he understands what God wants us to understand as Christians about the cost of our salvation and what we benefit from it. So, we, we have been uh, in a study on the healthy church for those who are with us for the first time, and we're studying the nine elements that are in the cup of the theology of the blood. And so, we've studied, for example, we're in our fifth today, we, uh, fifth. We have studied reconciliation, reconciled by the blood of Christ, Ephesians 2, 13 to 14, if you remember. We now know what that means. We are reconciled through the blood of Christ. Now we know when we lift that cup and put it to our lips, we understand that one of the nine things we get from the blood of Christ is reconciliation. The enmity that we had through Adam's sin against God has been removed, and we're now brought into a reconciled peace with God issue. That's one thing. The other thing we studied was redemption. We're redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. 
redemption is, is purchasing somebody from the slave market of sin and, and bringing them into an issue of freedom, like in Galatians 5.1. It was for freedom that Christ set you free. Free from what? From a damning sin and from being in the slave market of Adam's sin. You had to be redeemed. The whole principle of the exodus of the Old Testament, exodus, the whole issue of exodus of the Old Covenant is about redemption. You remember how they had to put blood on the, the doorpost of the homes? Yeah. The death angel went over. No blood, death. And so there, there are great examples of that. And then we studied, we studied propitiation. I mean, who, who talks about propitiation today? Propitiation is appeasing the wrath of God. Everybody's born under the wrath of God through Adam's sin. And that's the, of the 13 judicial charges, that's the, that's the granddaddy of it. And when Christ's blood, he, he appeases the wrath of God and, and gives, us, gives us absolute assurance that when we die, we go to heaven because we're no longer under the judgment. Everybody's going to go through judgment. When you die, the next deal on your issue is judgment. For the believer, he goes through the judgment seat of Christ. For, other believe, for the unbeliever, he goes to the, the judgment of the great white throne. But you see... You don't have to go to the great white throne of because Jesus, when he died on the cross, one of the days, his, his blood propitiates you. It, it satisfies the judgment, the judicial judgment of God called wrath. And that will never be upon your life ever again because Jesus died one death to remove it. It's a wonderful doctrine, and it's all connected to the blood of Christ. Then we studied justification. Justification is a marvelous doctrine about the blood of Christ because justification says a ransom price was required to get us out of the slave market of sin and that, that God, set the, God set the price, the ransom price in his son, the blood issue. The ransom has to be paid judicially that God accepts. The only thing he accepts is his son on the cross and his blood is death. And what that death brought in the idea of the blood of the Old Testament fulfilled in the New Testament. And so justification says that here's justification. We've been acquitted from judicial sin in Adam. You know, like 1 Corinthians 15, 22, in Adam all die, in Christ all made her alive. That issue is over. And the person, listen, justification. Justification says the justice of God has been satisfied by the blood of Christ. All, all 13 judicial charges of Adam's sin have been, have been erased by judgment. And the person is now, has now been made just or righteous by God, blood, by the blood of Christ, because God, God signed off to every person that believes in Christ on the cross, burial, resurrection, becomes just and justified. Now, today, we're looking at the word cleansing. This is the fifth of nine. In that cup of the Eucharist, dear hearts, the Bible, Peter says in 2 Peter 3.18, grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Eucharist is mandatory in the Christian church. I don't know of a church worth their salt that doesn't tell their congregation the Eucharist is mandatory. Agreed? It's mandatory. It's one of the few constant ordinances that we have among, among the Christian churches. But let me tell you if, you're, if, if you, if you're saved, by that I mean you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead you're obligated to understand what's in that cup when you drink it in remembrance of him because the cup is not just the cup. It's the cup of the blood of Christ. Agreed? I didn't make this up now. I just read it. It's 1 Corinthians eleven twenty five. This is the This cup is the new covenant in my blood. 
And Paul takes that idea and he lays this all out. I mean, how did I learn it, Ron? I learned it by studying the Bible, listening to Paul, lay out, studied everything the Bible had to say about blood in the New Testament as well as in the Old, looked down there, and this is what I found. And for Paul, it was very important that you understand what was the element, the, uh, the blood. What did the blood secure for me as salvation that ca would cause me to t lift my, my cup and, and, and in honor of what Christ did on the cross for me and say to God, I am so thankful for this. I am so thankful for the cost of heaven for me on earth. And so here we are today. We're looking at the concept of cleansing, and we're at verse 12. <laughs> Four to Hebrews 5.12. Listen to verse, listen to verse of, of 13. L let me start at 12 again. I got carried away. Have I had prayer? Well, I feel my engine starting to run. Can I stop for a minute? Uh, but I start preaching right there. Let's have a word of prayer. And let me, let me come back, verse 12, and close this up here. Look at this thing. Father, we understand that the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. Believers, believers cannot understand it as unbelievers can't because they're not saved, but believers can't understand it because they're carnal. They're carnal. What's the evidence of carnality? The evidence is personal sin. It could be mental attitude sins. It could be overt sins. It could be sins of the tongue, and they must be confessed. Again, we're dealing with the blood of Christ. In 1 John 1, 7, it is the blood of Christ that cleanses us. Verse 9 says, therefore, as believers, we can confess our sins to the Lord. We confess our sins, and he is faithful to forgive us and cleanse us. The cleansing from the cross of Christ is extended to the believer's life by confession of sin. Why is that so important? It's called fellowship with God. The communion fellowship with God, not our relationship, our fellowship with God. We're so thankful for that, Father. And it brings us back to that place of spirituality, a place where the Holy Spirit is able to minister the word of God to our life, and it can be a learning experience today. Today, it's about the cleansing. The cleansing, we, re we sang it in a song. I mean, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Christ. And so here we are, Father, and encourage our hearts to understand uh, these nine factors. And today, the idea of, of cleansing, or in theology, we call it purification. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's take a look at this again at the passage. For if the blood of goats and bulls and, and ashes of heifers sprinkling those who had been defiled, sanctified for the cleansing of the flesh, how much, say, it didn't cleanse the soul, it cleansed the flesh. Nothing's going to cleanse the soul until the blood of Christ comes historically. And he goes on, if the blood of the goats and the bulls, and, oh, oh, I just read that. How much more, I love that, how much more, how much more is what you ought to pay attention to, will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, that, that 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 says, that the Lamb of God that came to take away the sin of the world, like John 1, 29, has to, had to be spotless, and ble without blemish. Here's what it means. No birth defects, virgin birth. No birth defects, virgin birth. And no sin. He lived 33 years on earth without sin. Whoa. Now, I don't know how long Adam lived, but he eventually sinned. So, Paul in 2 Corinthians 5 uh, 21 can say, he who knew no sin, 2 Corinthians 5, 20, he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's a marvelous transition. And so how much more with the blood of Christ? Uh, cleanse your, cleanse, there's our word, cleanse your conscience from dead works, old covenant. Listen, whatever the blood meant in the old covenant is dead works now is dead works. That's the whole subject of 8, 9, and 10 of Hebrews. Cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve a living God. Isn't that marvelous? Serve a living God. And for this reason, he, Jesus Christ, is the mediator of a new covenant. A mediator. Mediator between whom? The unbeliever and God. 
the, the sinner and the righteous God. He goes on. In order that since a death, Christ on the cross, has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions, Adam's sin, and were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of an eternal inheritance. Fifty things you receive in salvation you can never lose in time and eternity. And, where, and, and for where a covenant is, well, I'm going to quit at 15, okay? Because then it gets into a whole number, another subject. So here's where we are. We're going to look at the word cleansing today. In theology, we also call that purification. I'm going to show you how this thing works. I'm going to show it to you. Point number one. In the Greek, notice the little Greek word I gave you, just for those who are Greek students, K-A-T-H-A-I-Z-O. You got that? Notice it on your paper. That's the Greek word that's used for cleansing. I say that to you because it's very important theologically because we know our English Bible, uh, New Covenant, was written in the Greek in the original language. The Greek is used for cleansing. Katarzeo, it refers to making clean from defilement of sin based on the word of God. See, the word cleansing, cleansing from what? Defilement, defilement of what? Cleansing. What will wash away? Cleansing from defilement. Defilement of what? See, that's old covenant to new covenant. Of what? Sin. It is used in Hebrews, the ninth chapter, verse 14, with the phrase, beginning with the phrase, how much more? Now, what this actually refers to is verse 13. In verse 13, the word if, if you look at Hebrews 9, 13, the word if is often overlooked because in the English we only have one. And you have to pay attention to what people are saying when they say if, what if means. But in the Greek language, they had four. They had a first, second, third, and fourth. And in the Greek language, when they used it, you paid attention whether it was a first, second, third, or fourth, and you knew exactly what they were talking about. Notice on your paper, I told you that in verse 13, that's a first-class conditional. There's always an if and a then. This is first class. First class means it's if and it's true. If it's true in the if part of the clause called the apodosis, then it's true in the apodosis or the then part of the clause. That's really important in this whole discussion because it, we, we, we have the apodosis in 13 and we have the apodosis, the then part in verse 14. Read it one more time. If the blood of goats and ashes of heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled, sanctify the cleansing of the flesh, how much more then will the blood of Christ, if that was true then, think about what that, because that was shadow pointing to the coming of Christ who would go to the cross and his blood would take care of the whole business, past, present, and future, because he's going to die one death for all sin for all time. Christ only got to die one death for his. When he comes back the second time, Hebrews 9th chapter, verse 28, when he comes back the second time, it's not in regard to sin. Even though it's in regard to salvation, it's not the salvation from sin that took, was taking place on the cross. When he comes back the second time, he's not coming back to go to a cross. The issue is not sin. The issue is redemption or deliverance out of the conditions of which the world is in. For the church, it's a rapture. For others, a tribulation, etc. Okay? It refers to making clean from defilement of sin based on the word of God. When you look at Hebrews 9.14, and look at it a little more technically than we do just reading, it says, how much more will the blood of Christ through the eternal spirit offered himself? When you read John, the 10th chapter, 11 through 18, you always look for markers when you read the Bible. What, does, what is the writer repeating in context? When you look at John, the 10th chapter, 11 through 18, you're going to find something mentioned four times. That's a lot. Four times. And what you're going to discover is a phrase that says, I lay down my life. When you read that John passage, I just put it there for you to read later. When you read it, what you're going to say, you're going to hear Jesus say, Four times to his disciples as he prepares himself for the cross. I lay, nobody takes it. 
I lay it down means voluntarily. I volitionally lay it down for God. I lay my life down for God. God sent me to lay my life down for him. I lay my life down for him. On behalf of you. He says that four times to his disciples. They didn't get it. Uh, William says you have to hear it ten times to get it. Maybe he's right. Maybe he's right. <clears throat> I lay down my life. And this is what he means by offered himself. He offered himself means when he says, I lay down my life. Without, he, lays, he offers himself without blemish. I explained that out of 1 Peter 1, 9, without blemish and spot. And, and Peter calls it the precious blood. The precious blood. There's no blood like it. Never, never. No one else could ever do this. No other human being in the world. He'd have to be virgin born and impeccable before he could give his blood. Nobody, nobody but one man. In theology, we call it the hypostatic union of the unique man of the universe, Jesus Christ. And then he says, cleanse. And he uses the verbal form of that cleanses, and he puts it in the future tense. Isn't that interesting? But see, it's future tense and contents because of verse 13. He's talking about the past, the old covenant, and the coming of Christ in the new covenant, his blood, and therefore he puts it in the future tense to show you that when he comes, the past is taken care of, the present is taken care of, and the future is taken care of. That's why it's future tense. It's future tense in regard to the old covenant. And as we look at it here, because of context, because it's a first-class conditional if in 13 explained in 14. It's just interesting. I don't know. It's, to me, it's just interesting. So what's interesting to me, I share because I'm the speaker. All right? So what he's talking about, it, what, what the writer of Hebrew 8, 9, and 10 is talking about is the theology of the blood of Christ. Uh, point number two, that's the verb. <laughs> the verb is called cleansing. Now listen to me. The noun of the same word in the Greek is not called cleansing. It's called purification. What purification does in theology, it covers the whole subject. And that's going to be important. The subject of how, how the purification works for the unbeliever and how purification works for the believer. When we look at that in theology, we look at it under this umbrella called purification through the blood of Christ. It affects the unbeliever, and it affects the believer. How do I know it? Because we do the Eucharist. We do the Eucharist. And the Eucharist talks about the blood of Christ. And the theology behind it is called purification. And it's a theological term that covers the whole issue of the blood of Christ on the idea of purification, cleansing. There's a one for the unbeliever, and there's a part for the believer, and we call that purification theology. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. It is used in such a way in Hebrews 1.3. In Hebrews 1.3, it, it's written this way. He is the radiance of his glory, the exact reputation of his nature. He's talking about Jesus and God. In John 10, 28 through 30, in verse 30, Jesus said, I and the Father are one. Later, he says, if you've seen the Father, you've seen me. Or if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, I guess. I don't know if you can see the Father in this scene, but anyhow. He is the radiance of his glory. Jesus is the radiance of God's glory because he's the Son. And the exact representation of his nature, divinity, John 10, 30, and upholds all things by the power of his, the, the, by the word of his power. And when he had made purification for sins, that's on the cross, he sat down at the right hand of God the Father. So we have this umbrella of theology that's connected with the death of Christ. One is his death on the cross is for the unbeliever is extended to the believer him seated at the right hand of God the Father. So when you take part in the Eucharist 
on the one hand, you toast him going to the cross. In the other hand, you toast him seated at the right hand of God the Father because he's coming back. How do I know it? Because 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six 26 says so. You proclaim, it says, you proclaim his death until he comes. Agreed? You need to start reading your Bible a little more. Read your Bible. And so when you take part in the Eucharist, on the one hand, you say, I thank you for the blood of Christ, and you go through with the blood of Christ. You do this in remembrance of me. You go through the nine things. We put them down. I'm just trying to explain what all that means to you. And then on the other hand, you toast that he's seated at the right hand of God the Father in charge of the church, in charge of my life, in charge of the world. I mean, he's got a big responsibility up there. And we toast that because he says the first thing I do, it was I, when I get up off that seat, when I get up off that throne, I'm going to come back and get you. In the meantime, some are going to die and be with me. I'm going to bring them with me. The reunion is going to be in the air. Think about that. I think everybody thinks the reunion, the reunion is going to be right there for everybody. The church is going to be reunited. Those who have died and with Christ, he'll bring with him, and we who are alive will remain. We'll be caught up together with them, and there will be a big reunion in the sky. You talk about shouting and hollering and, and all that, that will be quite a, quite a meeting. There's the, there's the big meeting. Well, anyhow, uh, purification. So we got cleansing. That's the practical part. Practical part for the unbeliever, the practical part for the believer. Are you with me? Point three. The noun purification is the doctrinal term, which I just explained over the umbrella. P point three. God has two different processes, one for the unbeliever and one for the believer. Agreed? Yes. Well, I mean, I, I just explained that, right? Yes. The purification. The cleansing is the practical part. The cleansing, the practical part. If you believe the gospel that he died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead, you believe that, then you get the cleansing. The blood does nine things for you that can never be changed in time and eternity. That's the unbeliever. For the believer, how does that work? For the unbeliever, he's got to believe the gospel to get it. What does the, what, how does the blood of Christ work for the believer? Would that be fair? Because this says there's an umbrella over it called purification. It works for the unbeliever. It also, the blood of Christ under purification or cleansing, mechanics, practical mechanics. How does the cleansing of blood work for the believer mechanically? Now, when you turn to your page, you'll notice there's, there's a cross, right, and two circles. The unbeliever, cleansing from the unbeliever. See the cross? Now that cross is Christ on the cross. Then there's a line down. That's his burial. And then the arrow that goes up is his resurrection. We call that the gospel. Christ died for our sins, was buried, and raised from the dead the third day. Agreed? That's what Easter's about. Okay. Well, here we are in Easter business. Now, see the two circles? The circle on your left, write the word Adam. And the circle on the right, write Christ. Then you write down 1 Corinthians 15, 22. It says, because in Adam we all die. That's every human being is born in Adam. If you're human, not vegetable, animal. If you're human, you're born in Adam. The only person who was born in Adam was Jesus Christ, virgin birth. On the other side, you say, you have Christ. Here's what he said. In Adam all die. In Christ all are made alive. That's eternal life. The question is, how do you get out of Adam and get into Christ? So write down on your paper Colossians 1, 13 and 14. In Colossians 1, 13 and 14, it says this. It says, the day you believe that Christ died for your sins were buried and raised from the dead, Romans 1, 16 says, that when you believe, the power to save you is in the gospel. The gospel is the power of God to save everyone who believes. Everyone who believes. Then Ephesians, the second chapter 8 and 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourself is a gift of God. Salvation is a gift. Courtesy of Christ dying on the cross for our sins, and God uh, justifying everybody who believes from it. Okay? Now, 
over on the Adam side, you got penalty. And over on the Christ side, you have pardon. Are you with me? You got penalty. What's the penalty? 13 judicial charges of Adam's sin upon all people. That's what the nine things of the, of the blood of Christ, the nine things of the blood of Christ, what they do is they tell you what the blood of Christ secured for you over here on the unbeliever side and how you're benefited on the believer side from it. You're in a slave market over here. You've been redeemed from it. Now, in Colossians 1, 13 and 14, here's what Colossians says. He says, the moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, watch this now, you are rescued. The word is rescued. You are rescued from Adam. There, put an arrow. Look, put a line. Look up here. You see where you wrote Adam? On the left, by the circle on the left. Take you a line and go from Adam to the cross. Boom. Just put a, put a line over there. Go from Adam to cross. Because when you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, Colossians 1.13 says, he rescues you. See, you can't get out of that. You can't get out of Adam's sin by yourself. God sent his son to die on the cross. It required the blood of the son of God. And when you believe the gospel, you are rescued by the grace of God. You are rescued from a position at Adam by the cross. Now, I'm in Colossians 1.13. Now, from the cross, run a line over to Christ. Are you with me? Just take a line, run it over to Christ. Colossians says, when you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you are rescued from Adam by the cross of Christ, and through the cross of Christ, you are, listen to me, you are transferred into Christ and his kingdom, which is his church. Now, I didn't write this, and you can read it. It's as clear as the English can get, Colossians 1, 13, 14. That whole process of being rescued from Adam and transferred to Christ is the salvation experience of every human being that believes the gospel, and that's grace. It's not you that do it. It's not how you work your way to do it. It's you're saved by grace through faith and not of yourself as a gift of God, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. See, that's, and the mechanics over here of rescuing and trans, this whole deal here, this right here, and when that person believes, he gets cleansed from his sins. And those, those, he's in the slave market, he gets redeemed. He's at enmity, he gets reconciled. He's under the raft of God, he gets propitiate, appeased the raft of God, propitiates. The blood of Christ propitiates that. A pardon, a, a pardon price was placed on, on you to be transferred. All of that was placed to Christ. So substitutionally, he died for you. He paid the ransom price. That's called justification. And as a result, over here, you stand acquitted and justified and righteous in the sight of God. Now, down below... We have the believer. We have the believer. See the circle on the left? Put an X through it. That's no longer a deal. That deal is done. You know when that deal was done? That deal was done when Christ died on the cross, was buried and raised from the dead on the third day. That deal was done. Now, every person who comes to believe in Jesus Christ that X's out. This whole 13 judicial charges are X'd out. God, in his justice, can never, can never charge you again with that. The law of double jeopardy. He can't ever charge you again with that. Never can charge you with again with that because blood, the blood of his son was what was the ransom price. Once the ransom price is paid, there's not another new ransom price offered. It's done deal. You understand that? That's propitiation and justification. So that box is, you're no, you're no longer an Adam. That deal is over, over and out, gone. The whole issue now is you and Christ. Positional truth. 
Galatians, the third chapter, well worth your time to write. Galatians, the third chapter, verse 27 says, the moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, Galatians, 2, Galatians 3, 2, in verse 27 says, the moment you believe Galatians 3, 2, that the Holy Spirit baptizes you into Christ. The Holy Spirit, at the point of salvation, does eight works. He does eight works in your life that can never be taken from you. One of those is to baptize you in the Holy Spirit, by, by the Holy Spirit, baptizes you into Christ. That transferal baptize you into Christ. You are into Christ from that point forever. It's called eternal redemption. It's in the ninth chapter of Hebrews. It's called... And, now the issue, and listen, another work of the Holy Spirit, at that point, he indwells you. He takes up residence in your life, in your body. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says, at the point of salvation, the Holy Spirit takes up residence in your body. And your body becomes the temple of God, the naos. You know what the, why the naos is important? That's where atonement took place. Once a year for the nation of Israel, Yom Kippur or Yom Kippur, however you want to do it. That deal's over. All that took place on the cross of Jesus Christ. That day's over. It just tears me up to see the Jews celebrate this holiday when they, they ought to be involved in the Easter. They don't, they don't understand their Bible. That's pitiful. At least read your Bible and understand it. And so that, that deals out. That deals out. And so here we have the position in Adam. Now, the reason for the indwelling Holy Spirit, you know what, you know what that is? You know what the Holy Spirit is? It's a person. It's not it. You know what the Holy Spirit is? He's the third member of the Godhead. Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Do you know, Christ is seated at the right hand of God the Father. So who's seated here? Who's seated here? If he's seated there, and he is until the second coming, then who is seated here? The, whole, the third member of the Godhead. He's, listen, the Holy Spirit is a much, much, has the same essence as God, the same essence of Christ, just a different responsibility. His responsibility is to live inside your body. And John 14, 16, he's not permitted to leave you ever. Now, don't you know that's been a tough hole? Huh? Do you know that's been tough? John 14, 16, he's not permitted to leave you. Once he enters, he's not permitted. And his job is to bring spirituality to your life, to make you understand the word of God, to make you understand how you're to live the Christian life. You're to live, the reason it's called spiritual because it's spirit of God. You take the word spirit out of that word and you ain't got much. And listen, if you don't understand the dynamics, you, you're, you're commanded to walk in the, 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 by means of the Holy Spirit. You're commanded in Galatians 5.16 to walk in mean, by means of the Holy Spirit. So the whole dynamics of the Christian life based on the blood of Christ, listen to me, is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Now, there's a warfare in every believer in the church age over carnality versus spirituality. You can read about this in 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3. There's a war. And at any given time in your life, you're either carnal or spiritual. You're never neutral. Never. So you're either carnal or spirit. And I said in my opening prayer, what is the evidence of carnality? It's personal sin. It could be mental attitude sins. It could be sins of the tongue or it could be overt sins. But evidence of carnality is sin. So what do you do with it? How do I get, whoa, watch this word. How do I get cleansed from it? 1 John 1, 9. Now listen to me. I want you to look it up, and then I, I'm going to close this thing down, and I, we're going to have a little bit of time here with Josh for a minute. 
I ran over Josh and I apologize. Look at, look at 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, the, if we is us, usins, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. And what? Cleanse us. Now look at verse 7. This is how this works. This is purification on the side of the Christian. Not on the side of the unbeliever, but on the side of the believer. Look at verse 7. It's talking about where this cleansing started with the blood of Christ. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, uh, meaning with the children of God, with the Father, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all time. When did that happen? On the cross. So you see the cross works on behalf of the unbeliever to bring him into the kingdom. It works on the behalf of the believer who is in the kingdom to stay spiritual. So how do I remain spiritual? Carnality takes me out of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Confession of sin puts me back into fellowship with God through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. You understand that? Well, if you do, you understand purification. Okay? Father, we're so thankful for these that have come today with us, both by the Internet and by automobile. We pray, Father, the Holy Spirit would minister the truth. As, uh, as stated here in our lesson, and now we come to the offering time, Father. We, we don't challenge unbelievers, and we don't challenge visitors. This is for people that understand the ministry of this church and how to give money uh, through the principle of grace. And so we take this offering, Father, and make us good stewards of it to reach the most for the many with the least uh, of the finances. And we know that's how you do business, and we're proud of that. Be with Josh as he comes to us and explains his, his mission uh, to Spain, Madrid. And, and we're thankful for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.